get more confidence, get that promotion, get moving up the corporate ladder, get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu and Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deer, the Interim Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs, here with your wintry host, Ben Wiggins. <laughs> I am feeling very wintry today, Shannon. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. This will uh, come out weeks after our major snow event, but we did have snow yesterday and it was magical. Magical. It was amazing. Did y'all have fun? I was at the office. We've what? got uh, beginning of year buys going on right now. Uh, and I, I left before the snow really started and before it became clear that College Station was going to be a winter wonderland. And then I got to drive home through the winter wonderland. So that was uh, it was fun, but I did not experience it the way that some did. No, I guess not. That is uh, that's not the way you experience a once in every five ish years snow experience here. Yeah. The upside is it's uh, it's still kind of snowy out today. And also, uh, Brielle did not enjoy the snow nearly as much as we would have hoped. So (laughs) I can understand that. She's a little bit too young for it. Yeah. 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 Crash, our dog, made snow angels. So that was really funny to watch. We made a snowman and it was just gorgeous to watch it all day. I mean, it was really coming down most of the day. Yeah, we had fun. So how are you? I'm doing well. We're it's a it's a very busy time, but uh doing well. And Good. uh yeah, looking forward to you know, moving moving with uh speed and high hopes into 2021. Good. Good. All right. Well, let's jump into the intro today on the show. We have John Hoffmeister. I really enjoyed John's interview. I want to make all of my energy finance students listen to his episode because it was just so well done. And he's so thoughtful and has such valuable experience in the energy industry. John is known as a straight shooting energy insider. He established and heads the nonprofit association Citizens for Affordable Energy. He had many different different books that he recommended for lots of different experts on affordable energy and clean energy and how to distribute energy worldwide. He retired as the president of Shell Oil Company in 2008, so a giant operation and a top company. And he, in his current endeavor, his public policy firm promotes sound U.S. energy security solutions for the nation, including a range of affordable energy supplies, efficiency improvements, essential infrastructure, sustainable environmental policies, and public education on energy issues. So really important work that John is doing with all of his years of experience. He's a business leader who has participated in the inner workings of multiple industries for over 40 years. He talks about his experiences at General Electric, Nortel, Allied Signal, which is now Honeywell International, and then, of course, his experiences at Shell Oil Company. Hoffmeister has served as the chairman of many different organizations on board of directors and in a nonprofit capacity. He is also the author of Why We Hate the Oil Companies, Straight Talk from an Energy Insider, which is such a great title for a book. I can't wait to read it. And he talks about how we shouldn't, don't really hate the oil and gas companies, but how some of their operations create some challenges. And so he does a great job um, talking about that on the show as well. Hoffmeister serves as a Wrigley Scholar in the Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State University, and he also is a lecturer at the University of Houston and Kansas State University. So giving back his expertise to students of this next generation working in the oil and gas industry. We hope you enjoy the episode with John. Let's get into it. We welcome John Hoffmeister to the show. How are you doing? Doing fine, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. What is your favorite superpower? Probably curiosity. To me, curiosity is like a fountain of youth. Yeah. You, keep, you keep finding new things and you keep discovering what you don't know. 
and and uh, along with that, probably imagination. I uh, just I love to imagine what could be, and how it could be, and who could be what. And so yeah. it's a it's a process that I think I've nurtured throughout my really uh, throughout my life. Let's uh, let's back up a second. Where did you where did you grow up? I grew up in a little town in Pennsylvania called New Holland, which is in the Pennsylvania Dutch country, and it was a rural setting about 3,000 people in the town. We had uh, one police officer <laughs> full-time and one part-time. So it was that kind of a safe, isolated community. How many in your family? Nine, counting parents. Seven wow. children, two adults. What, w- what was that like? I mean, I, I know everybody only knows their own experience, but... Uh... I learned to wait in line in the, for the bathroom. And <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any funny stories from your early career? Well, I, I had a couple of experiences in my career, which maybe weren't funny at the time, but in retrospect are hilarious. Uh, one, one of which, uh, I was never a very good athlete, but I was determined to play golf. I used to go out on Saturdays and uh, play with my boss. Well, one day, one Saturday, it was my boss and his boss that we went to play golf. Yeah, And I th- had my miserable first eight holes. And on the ninth hole, I actually got a par, my first par of the day. Wow. So I was celebrating my par as we moved to the 10th hole, where I had honors because I'd I'd won the hole first time all day. Sure. First time in weeks, I'd won a hole. So so I was the the par five, number 10 hole. I lined up a couple of practice swings, gave it a mighty swing with my driver, drove the ball exactly sideways the ball went into the golf cart bounced out of the golf cart hit boss number one on the shins <laughs> hit boss number two in the stomach oh, one shot wow <laughs> they called it a threefer we'll never forget bad enough that they had to pause while they recovered from the in- initial pain Ugh. well i gotta tell you that was my last ever day of golf Except yeah. when I was president of Shell Oil, I hosted the Shell uh, PGA tournament each year, the Shell Houston Open. Yeah. So that took me back to the golf course, but not as a player. The players, all, the pros always said, oh, John, you got to come play around with us and as, as a courtesy. And I said, you, you really don't. <laughs> and, you told, and you told that story, and that was the end of it. <laughs> Multiple times, yeah. <laughs> then moving from Shell... Uh, it to you're now the current CEO for uh, for Citizens for Affordable Energy. How did you have to alter your leadership approach moving from a Fortune 10 company to a public policy firm? Well, it was quite a transition, actually, but I had time to think about the steps I would need to take. As the president of Shell Oil Company, my corporate staff was 300 people. Mm-hmm. So I had 300 people across legal, finance, human resources, public relations, yeah, all of these staff support functions of a major company. We had $120 billion in revenue. So this is a pretty good sized company. And this was the U.S. subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell called Shell Oil. And uh, realizing that I had to retire at age 60, that's the company policy for executives above a certain level, uh, I knew that I was getting up there and getting close to 60. So probably three or four months ahead of time, I knew what I wanted to do when I retired, and that was to advance the work that I had been doing as president of Shell uh, to get into the public policy of energy and the environment. And what better way to do it than to establish a not-for-profit that I could put my my brand on, so to speak, because I had developed something of a a personal, uh, popular brand as president. I had a lot of time in front of the cameras and a lot of time in front of audiences as the president of Shell Oil. So I took that approach and really developed uh, a way of conveying my thoughts about the future of energy and the environment. And the way I developed my thoughts was to write a book. So I wrote a book called Why We Hate the Oil Companies. And in that book, I parcel out the whole of energy and the environment as four major sectors that have to be dealt with if we're going to deal with energy and the environment. And so I was one of the early promoters in the, I retired in 2008, 
from then till now, I've been promoting the 21st century energy transition, which remediates the environment to pre-industrial levels, ultimately. Mm. Maybe not everything is done this century, but by the next century, we should have the earth at pre-industrial levels of pollution, land, water, and air. And we should be working with a carbonless or carbon-free energy system. It's mm. doable, not overnight. Nobody can push a button and make it happen. It takes a lot of cooperation, a lot of investment, a lot of honest ingenuity, innovation that still has to be invented. But I believe it can be done. Mm. And, and so that's, I decided to set that up. And so from a leadership standpoint, it was moving from the leadership of people, organization, processes, profitability, uh, market share, et cetera, reputation, to establishing a focus on public policy. The who is important, the what is important, the how, the why, it's all important. And I had one person part-time working for me. So I learned to do everything myself. What, what else has changed since the book was published? Have any of the issues that you've dealt with in the book, have any of those gotten worse? Which ones have gotten better? What, what, how has the landscape changed since you wrote the book? One of the key points in my book, which I explain as clearly as I possibly could, is the impossible governance of energy. Mm. Today, energy and the environment are governed in an impossible pathway with the federal government, the state governments, and the local governments getting in each other's way. Yeah. With a two-year time cycle, which is our political cycle, governing everything about the future of energy and the environment. Every two years, we elect new representatives, whether that's mayors, city council members, governors, state legislators, U.S. congressional members, senators, presidents, Every two years is an election. You cannot in any way, with the federal system, the way it is currently set up, on a two-year priority setting basis, right. figure out the future of energy and the environment. Hmm. That system, which we knew in the, uh, in, throughout time in this country, works for democracy to operate. And I won't, don't propose changing from democracy and constitutional rights for the privilege of freedom and independence and all the things we want in our democracy. But what we found in the late 1800s, early 1900s, was that our finance system wasn't working. The financial system was crashing and cratering. In fact, in 1907, the U.S. Treasury had no money. And President Roosevelt called up J.P. Morgan on Wall Street said, you got to help us out. The U.S. government has no money. We have no cash. J.P. Morgan and his cohorts on Wall Street floated a loan to the U.S. Treasury to keep the government going. Many people yeah. don't know that story. And he promised, we'll never do this again. Well, we did in 1912. But in 1913, we got the Federal Reserve Act passed by Congress, signed by President Wilson. From Teddy Roosevelt to William Taft to President uh, Wilson, we developed an independent regulatory system for the financial uh, processes of this nation. It's called the Federal Reserve. Yeah. The Federal Reserve is an independent regulatory body, democratically appointed and democratically operating, but it's isolated from the political cycle. It's isolated from the politics of the two-year election. And we have the strongest financial system in the world, Ben. Yeah. It works. It's worked mm -hmm. for 100 years plus. Why can't we do the same for energy and the environment? So my book is all ah. about trying to sort out the governance of energy because we really don't hate the oil companies. They earn hundreds of billions of dollars a year from American consumers. What we hate is the image of the oil companies, not yeah. the company. Because we use their products and, and everything from uh, glasses, meaning the, uh, the, the eyeglasses that we wear that are made out of products that come from oil, to yeah. pharmaceuticals, to joints, body joints replacements, to just the normal mobility 
that we have with internal combustion engines yeah. and jet engines and, and natural gas for power generation. So yeah. we don't hate that. We, what, what's not working is the governance of energy. Yeah. So if we don't get some kind of an independent regulatory authority to guide the future of energy over long-term cycles, not two-year political terms, but long-term, 10, 20, 30-year cycles, that's what we need to really make the energy transition work in the 21st century. So the big question then is, this is obviously a good idea, so why doesn't it exist yet? Well, I've been all over Capitol Hill. I've been all over cabinet agencies, and I've been to the White House on why doesn't it happen. And the answer is very simple. The politicians look at me after I've explained the situation and say, you're talking about taking away my power. Mm. It's my power to decide during my time in office what the policy will be. I'm not going to let you take away my power. So I say to myself, what kind of an individual is so focused on their personal power agenda that the good of the nation or the good of the world is set aside because of this aphrodisiac that they are infected with called power. And I, I just am appalled that they can't see the bigger picture. And I'm talking about leadership in the House, leadership in the Senate, as well as ordinary members To the credit of some, they have said, John, that's the first reasonable explanation and solution that I've heard on what has mystified me, my political career. So it is not without some support from individual members, but the leadership, they have zero interest. And as was the case, Ben, if you track back the history of the Federal Reserve Act, it was fought mightily by political power, politically powerful people in the House and the Senate mm. when President Roosevelt, President Taft, and then President Wilson tried to make it happen. So this is a real issue with yeah. our democracy. Oh. Is it a democracy where people's voices matter, or is it about power to those who can get it and then keep it and yeah. then only do what is in their interest from a power-protecting standpoint? That's quite worrisome to the future of this democracy. Yeah, no question. Well, and it's it has to be difficult for you personally. You've talked a lot about setbacks and the concept of a setback. How do you how do you deal with something like that when you run into a wall like that? Somebody says, "You're taking away my power," and you know that's the wrong answer coming from them, but there's at at, at some level that's that's a wall you have to go around. How do you deal with that? Well, it's a uh, I've run into a lot of setbacks throughout my career. Yeah. Uh, and the disappointment you have to learn to live with, it's humbling, but it's yeah. also educational. Yeah. And there's a very simple model I would say to my staff when we would run into an obstacle that we didn't know how to overcome. I would say, do we go over, under, around, or right through it? <laughs> I mean, that's the way you deal with setback and Coming back from a setback, you can go over, under, around, or through. Through is the most difficult. Uh, it's like trying to go through a line of, of big football players. <laughs> They're not going to let you come through very easily. Right. But you can go over, under, or around them before you go through them. And so you have to figure out the tactic and the end game. And there are some times where you just fold your cards and walk away because you're dealing with someone that's impossible or you're dealing with an issue that you just this is not the right time for it. So you have to have the common sense, the pragmatic view that not everything will go your way all the time, so you got to work at it. And what I've figured out with Citizens for Affordable Energy is one person, one speech, one event, one discussion, and keep doing it and doing it and doing it. The written record is out there. The idea permeates the United States for now, but not very many people that, that can be reached by one person like me. Using social media, using all the media available. Uh, and, and so in addition, I, I'm, I'm teaching as much as I can at three universities yeah. and trying to get the, the message across so that if it's not me, 
then it's people who can take my ideas and move them forward, uh, perhaps better than I can. As you, when you, uh, refer people to other ideas or if our listeners wanted to get a quick and dirty lesson on the future of industry and energy, what would you, what would you tell them to watch or read? Who would you tell them to follow? Anything and everything written by Daniel Jurgen, who is sort of the historian of the oil and gas industry. Yeah. Currently, but just wrote a new book called the new maps. I'm sorry, the new map singular Daniel Jurgen, Scott Pinker is a brilliant, brilliant thinker who focuses on energy and poverty. You know, the mm. poverty throughout the world is just, the endemic poverty is just shameful. That in the 21st century, we still have a billion plus people on this earth don't have a light bulb, don't have anything that's driven by electricity. Right. And they cook their food on dung because that's the fuel of choice. Uh, and so he, he's brilliant at connecting poverty and energy, and energy is the solution to poverty. Uh, I would say that Michael Weber uh, is a brilliant uh, expert, particularly in the power side of energy. And, you know, there are others that, uh, you know, I could continue to name people. But I think if you basically Google <laughs> anything related to energy and the environment, these names will come up. I would stay away from the politicians. The people who politicize energy or politicize the environment are pretty much useless to the yeah. solutions because all they care about is the political agenda. It's the science, the technology. You have to get down to the mo molecule and the electron of what it is that powers our light bulbs, our computers, everything that we do throughout the day. Mm -hmm. It's the electrons that matter and the molecules that matter not the political party. I tell all my students, there's no such thing as a Republican molecule. There's no such thing as a Democratic electron. So forget the politics of it. It's the substance of energy in the environment we have to understand. And that's what's going to change it, not some politician who has about two years as the longest period of time they, can, they have intact power. What motivated you to start teaching these students? You teach courses at two major universities. Yeah, there's a very good explanation. When I was president of Shell Oil, the nation was going through a high-priced gasoline period. Within 18 months, I testified in Congress. I don't know, I think it was five times. And I got beaten up by members of Congress, senators as well as members of the House, uh, over the price of gasoline. And the price of gasoline was high because OPEC was in charge. That's the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, which operates as an, under U.S. law as an illegal cartel. Yeah, cartel. Setting the price of oil by controlling the amount of oil available. And we knew in the U.S. we had so much more oil and natural gas that could be produced. But we couldn't get any support from any administration or any Congress. And, and so the... American people were squeezed into a limited supply by their own public politicians. Mm -hmm. and, and so we couldn't get permission for more access to more oil and gas right. until the shale revolution came along. And so during my tenure, I figured it's unfair for the American people to be criticized. Uh, I'm sorry, to criticize the oil industry when it's enfeebled by its own political process. Yeah. So I, along with my staff, created process. We, we, we created what we call the 50 city tour. And we took 250 shell executives over a period of a year and a half to 50 U.S. cities, mostly state capitals, where we spoke with governors, state legislatures, and townspeople from, you know, from Boston to Los Angeles. We crisscrossed the country in 50 different places. What I learned was what that was that people were hungry for information, whether whatever position they held, business leaders, uh, community leaders, everyday people. We had a town hall in every city we went to, with real town, just the townspeople. Yeah. Uh, we had met with business and chambers of commerce uh, committees and so forth. We met with politicians at every level, and what we what I came away with was people just have a need for information. 
And so what prompted me to set up Citizens for a Florida Bar Energy was just to satisfy that craving for information, which could lead to knowledge, which could lead to better informed citizens, which could perhaps lead to better public policy because of the awareness and the knowledge base of everyday people. And in that regard, I, I felt like that's what we need to do. We need to educate the public, not with any political purpose. You know, people don't know if I'm a Republican or a Democrat unless I tell them, because, you know, I, I care about who's in office, not the party that's trying to get people in office. And I, as I said, there's no such thing as a Democratic or Republican molecule or electron. So I'm, I'm just interested in sound public policy that transitions the energy and the environmental systems uh, in, from the 20th century to what we can produce for the 22nd century. And this mm. is the century of transition. I like it. I like it. Let's move to some rapid fire. And then I have one I have one question I'd like to come back to uh, from your time at Shell. Uh, but first, what was your greatest accomplishment at Shell? I think it was twofold. One it was my first job at Shell was to be the group human resource director. And my job was to move Shell's organization and businesses from being country focused to being globally focused. And what that meant was tearing down all the territoriality of a national company to build a service or product company across national borders. And if you come from a European background, that's a very big deal. Because although there is a European Union, every country within the European Union is sovereign. <laughs> and every sovereign nation around the world had its own shell company. And the shell companies of the sovereign nation operated quite independently mm -hmm. from each other. And that is a good thing in terms of focusing on the country itself, but it's a not a good thing when considering the integration and the harmony with which Shell does business globally. And so my job was to put together the plan and the process by which we could transform from a company of national businesses to a company of global businesses. That was a big deal. It took years and years to get that done. And, and uh, the second was the, the country that had the greatest difficulty with this was the U.S. Oh. Because the, the U.S. was a third of Shell. Uh, Shell oil is a third of Royal Dutch Shell. Yeah. And so it maintained its nationality very affirmatively. <laughs> and we don't want the Europeans telling us what to do in the United States of America. What do they know about the U.S.? So my final job at Shell, I was sent by the CEO of Shell to take over the U.S., to bring to the U.S. the same sense of, uh, of, of harmony and cooperation Fraternity. and tear down the borders of the U.S. Yeah. to operate okay. with the whole of Shell. Mm. And from a company efficiency and effectiveness standpoint, it all worked. So those two things worked in harmony. And, and I just give credit to the people of U.S. Shell because when they got the big picture and understood what was, what was the effort here, they got behind it with every muscle and fiber of their capability. And they, they, they pulled their oar just the way that I thought they would. Fantastic. Any decisions that you made that you would change or any things that you wanted to do that you wish you hadn't done? I think that... Um, I was disheartened when a decision I did not make, but I also did not oppose, took Shell out of the solar business mm. in 2006, 2007 timeframe. I, I just thought it was a wrong decision for Shell not to continue to invest in solar power. And I'm glad to see that Shell is back into solar power. I think it was a decision made on the basis of what Shell had done over a five-year period with solar, which was not much, and the costs were high. But solar is a long-term bet, and I think it was a mistake to get out of it. I didn't fight the mistake. I should have fought that mistake harder than what I did. And so Shell lost probably half a decade or more in the solar value chain. 
and I think I'm glad to see that they're not backing up. What was the thing that surprised you the most during your earlier or during your earlier career up through and including the presidency of Shell? What what was the biggest thing that you learned? I think if I look back and, and I worked for four different companies in my career, GE, Northern Telecom, Allied Signal, which is now Honeywell, and Royal Dutch Shell. Mm-hmm. So I have 45 years of experience over those four companies. I think what continuously impressed me throughout all those years was the significance of corporate activity on the environment, on the earth. The earth gives and we take so much from the earth, we have got to give back to the earth as well. And whether it was making electric motors or electric light bulbs, which I did in my GE career, whether it was the telecommunications of Northern Telecom, which is very energy intensive, whether it was the aerospace business of Honeywell, Allied Signal, where I I worked, and ultimately an oil and gas company, Royal Dutch Shell and Shell Oil, which is part of what I show. I think the, the fact that if we don't successfully operate and integrate our activities in all that we do to improve the quality of life, the, to improve what we do, how we do it, who we do it with, over the course of time, we can't surrender this earth to the filth of waste. In other, in other words, anything we do creates waste. We have got to commit ourselves as a people around the world to the productive uh, waste management. Productive waste management means we move to zero waste and we move to recover the waste that we have polluted on the land, the water, and the the air. And over time, we have got to do that as a people if the earth is going to continue to give to us. We've got to give it back to the earth that we get rid of our own waste. And that's that's not rocket science. That's just basic. No matter what it is, the packaging from the grocery store is one example. The, the, the devices that we seem to just toss away when they are outdated and we don't use them anymore. It's the exhaust of the tailpipes or the chimney stacks. It's the, uh, the, the liquids that uh, go into the rivers and the oceans from waste. Man- we just have to be a waste management society and move towards first neutral waste, and then net negative waste, so we clean up, clean up the earth. That, to me, has permeated my entire career, from as a young person, coming out of university, starting my first job, where I you know, saw you know a lot of construction, and a lot of building of plants, for example, or old plants that were ready to be rehabilitated, or frankly, torn down and disposed of. Uh, we, we've got to deal with the waste that we create on this earth, but the earth is not going to continue to be able to give to us. Anyone that you would like to send some good bull? One of the persons that has impacted me for decades is one of my former bosses, the person who recruited me to join Royal Dutch Shell, and that is a man named Mark Moody Stewart. Uh, a Brit, a brilliant man, temperate in everything he approaches, kind, gentle, and generous. He was the head of Shell, the head of one of the world's largest, oldest, most successful companies, had time for everyone. Mm. And generosity of spirit, generosity of heart, and he has made a brilliant contribution, not well known in the U.S. because he spent his career mainly in Europe or in the Middle East, where he spent served for quite a while, and in Africa. But uh, a man who taught me about, I would say, beneficence and diplomacy and patience and <laughs> incredible capability to get things done. And watching him, learning from him, working for him was one of the biggest pleasures of my life. I love that. Love that. John, thank you so much for your time. Okay, Ben. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the episode with John. For our Mastercast top three takeaways, I, as 
someone who teaches energy finance, and I talk about a lot of the issues with the industry and challenges that they face, as well as the many benefits that the industry provides us in our lives. I really thought that what he talked about with the impossibility of governance of energy under our current model was really interesting and how that two-year cycle of politics is not productive for creating lasting, meaningful change in the energy industry. I also thought that it's interesting that the energy industry is changing every day and that cycle is two years and just how on many different levels that creates complications or challenges for getting really significant change in a positive direction for the energy industry. Yeah, I think his idea about establishing an entity that doesn't have to answer to the politicians is it's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it makes me wonder, what other industries do we need this for? Because we have it in finance. We need it in energy. Where else? Where else? Yeah. But yeah, I really liked I really liked his pitch. Yeah, I think that it's a really interesting idea that we have something a little bit more independent. I, I don't know. It's hard to visualize what that might look like or how that might work today. You know, just without without I mean, the Federal Reserve, like you said, was a good model for that. But it was hard to for me to visualize what that would look like. But I'm certainly supportive of it. And he sounded sounded like a good idea. Yeah. For our second takeaway, this is related. I thought it was really interesting when he talked about the 1913 Federal Reserve Act, which, of course, I've heard a lot about and talked a lot about. But it just was striking to me in the conversation how recent that was or how fairly recent that was. And maybe it's because I'm getting older that things don't seem (laughs) that long ago, but how relatively recent 1913 was. And how significant of a change that was in the way that our economy was structured and how thinking of another change like that doesn't see, and it doesn't seem as crazy when I think about that being 1913 versus, I don't know, longer, longer than that. And how, just how recent our history is. It was really interesting for me to hear. One thing that I think is important to recognize is that everything happening right now seems like it is the way things are going to be forever. And if we all we have to do is look back 25 years to the pre-internet era Mm. to know that things change Um, and usually for the better, usually, especially over the long term, usually for the better. Sometimes what's right in front of us seems like uh, seems like it's never going to go away. I was thinking about that in the context of something that happened like when Ryan and I were dating. I don't even remember what it was, but I was thinking, I I wonder if we posted that on Facebook or, you know, I was thinking something about that. And I thought there wasn't that wasn't a thing really when we were first dating and just how how even in our relationship lifetime, how much has changed is really interesting. Yeah, agreed. For our last takeaway. I wanted to just add one more author to the list that John provided, and that's Bethany McLean. I've talked about her on the show before, but she was she wrote Smartest Guys in the Room about Enron. She most recently has written a book called Saudi America. And I, I really like her writing. I really like her. I've gotten to meet her a couple of times and just her insights. She talks a lot about kind of the history and evolution of the shale revolution. And she talks about the economics of fracking and oil and gas. And she pokes some holes in how that works and and a little bit about the environment and all those things. So I, she's just another really good author who provides some insight into these issues as well. Yes. When uh, he was talking about renewing the planet, I did not have a chance to jump in and talk about how your your hippie heart was shining, uh, right. was shining through the Zoom call. But uh, but I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to. That's right. My hippie heart was very proud of John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my mine too. Mine yeah. too. It, it's yeah. uh, it was really fascinating to have someone who is the the president of an oil company, the former president of an oil company, come on and talk about like the crucial nature of renewables and all of that. That was kind of made my soul sing a little as well. Well, and I liked his approach because it was so practical. Because yeah. he's had that experience of being the president of a large oil and gas company, where. Yeah. He did have a practical approach to it. He he did say, hey, we need... He, he wasn't like an environmentalist who says, let's get rid of oil and gas. It's not a reasonable solution, but he said we can do it better. And that I really appreciate about what he brought to the discussion. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was a really, it was a really great talk. Very, mm-hmm. uh, kind of, kind of eye opening in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we appreciate Don being on the show and you listening. Ben, do you want to close us with a quote? Have patience with everything that remains unsolved in your heart. Try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books written in a foreign language. Do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. It is a question of experiencing everything. At present, you need to live the question. Perhaps you will gradually, without even noticing it, find yourself experiencing the answer some distant day. Reiner Rilke. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help. Whether that's from start to finish, fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted, go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.